Hi folks, this is Dr. Rob Sivers, uh, the Carb Addiction Doc, and today we're going to do the fourth and final part in our starter kit of the mini-series Understanding Carbohydrate Addiction. But, but just before I start, I, I want to give a shout out to a few people out there. First of all, I got one person that leaves comments regularly, and that person is from Guam, and I've always, always wanted to visit Guam, so shout out to you. Our followers in San Diego, uh, not San Diego, sorry, Santiago, Chile. Shout out to you guys. This last month, more people from Santiago than any other city in the world watch these videos. So whoever's doing that, a shout out to you out there. And then we've got some very exciting things happening uh, in Portuguese, both in Brazil and Portugal with our Portuguese uh, followers. Uh, we're starting to translate some of our videos to, por to Portuguese. And I've got a... A podcast that I'm taping, taping later this afternoon with a group in Brazil, Low Carb Brazil, and um, it'll be translated into Portuguese. So shout out to you guys out there. Um, we will also be doing um, the Keto Summit in Omaha, Nebraska um, with Dr. Fit and Fabulous and a whole bunch of our friends for the first time live in about 18 months. That's in um, late August. And then the following week, I'm going to be speaking at Low Carb San Diego, um, the Low Carb event in San Diego organized by the SMH, no, not by SMHP, by the Low Carb Organization and Doug Reynolds. Um, so... Uh, Please, if you're interested, both live and virtually, you can see not just what we do, but also what everybody else does. So that's my shout out over there. However, now we're going to go to the dark side. Now we're going to go to the dark side of addiction. And so often, you see, I am the carb addiction doc on social media and on YouTube, but I'm also a clinically practicing doctor. I see patients of all kinds. And Typically, by the time people come into my office, they didn't just wake up this morning and said, oh, I'm fat, I need to go see a doctor. They are already experts at failing weight loss programs. And a lot of them have tried really hard and they failed keto and they failed this and they failed carnivore and they failed intermittent fasting. They've tried all of these things as a diet. And, and the challenge is to really understand the magnitude of the problem. Because what happens slowly over time, you don't just become fat in a day. You can be carbohydrate addicted for a decade as a young person before you start to see the obvious cracks in your life. The weight gain, maybe the diabetes, maybe the hypertension, maybe the cardiovascular disease. It can be a decade or longer. So there's no correlation between eating carbohydrates and suddenly sudden badness. You shoot up with heroin and you overdose, you can turn blue the very first hit you take. You can get a DUI the very first time you drink excessively. But you can eat a large pizza, eat a tub of ice cream, drink two gallons of Coke, and not feel a thing, not notice a thing, and that's the problem. It's insidious. So it sucks you in. And from a very, very early age, we fall in love with carbohydrates. And it's this most wonderful, wonderful affair. Because they're everywhere. Everyone's telling us how good they are. Here's a treat for you. Oh, just a little bit. It tastes so good. Gets you high, but it doesn't distort your normal brain function. It doesn't affect that. So you can function normally. And everyone's giving it to you and telling you it's so healthy. Oh, these apples are so good for you. Oh, these berries are so good for you. Oh, look, I'm, I bought some keto ice cream. It's so healthy for you. So we at Cond, we buy into this wonderful relationship. And carbohydrates are so effective that they take care of all of our needs. They're available to us from the morning to the evening. And even if you wake up in the middle of the night, you can go to the fridge and forage around and Get whatever you want, the sugar and starch. I had one patient who actually passed away recently of breast cancer, but she used to keep a two-liter uh, bottle of Coke under her bed. So all she had to do was reach down to it and grab it, and she could drink Coke in the middle of the night in her bed, just in case she wasn't high enough. She did so amazingly well on a ketogenic diet, but eventually passed from breast cancer. That's Karen. And so I want to share with you how this relationship works. 
because I get all the excuses. Oh, I have my kids need it. My husband doesn't want to do this. He needs his rights. He needs his, or, oh, someone baked me a cake for my birthday. Or, oh, I don't eat pasta. I've got to make it for my husband, but I, I don't, I won't ever eat it. It's in the, I won't eat. I get all of this. I get all of this BS. So let's be categorical about this. And I'm going to give you an analogy. I'm going to give you an analogy as an obese person, as a type 2 diabetic, as a hypertensive, as a cardiovascular person, as someone with PCOS, as someone with metabolic syndrome or metabolic disease, autoimmune disease, Hashimoto's. I'm going to give you a very vivid example of what your relationship with carbohydrates is actually all about. Because by the time you have significant, tangible, measurable disease, that relationship is broken. That relationship is out of control. And you're validating and justifying and trivializing and minimizing and rationalizing that relationship to yourself and everybody else around you in defiance of the harm it's causing you. Because all you desperately want is another hit, another high, another m and And you distort the reality of the harm to give you permission to indulge in your drug. I know it's not a good idea, but for this valid reason right now, it's okay. There's never, ever, ever a valid reason for an alcoholic to have a drink, and there's never, ever, ever a valid reason for a fat person to eat a carbohydrate unless they're a type 1 diabetic that's overdosed on insulin. We've got to understand it that way if it's going to be successful. So let me give you the analogy. I'm a surgeon. I have hospital privileges and I work in hospitals. I go to the ER from time to time. And this story actually comes from a few years ago because I'm a pediatric surgeon. And a few years ago, I was in the ER and I was called to see a girl and they were concerned that she had a ruptured spleen, a lot of abdominal pain. And uh, she was 17, almost 18 years old. And the story goes that she and her boyfriend, and he was a longstanding boyfriend, um, older guy, had gotten into a huge fight. They'd been drinking some alcohol, got into a huge fight, and he beat the crap out of her. So when I got pulled the curtain back and I got to see her, she had a black eye. She had cuts all over her, all over her head. We dragged her on the gravel. Uh, she had bruises and cuts all over her face, and uh, she looked like a train wreck. But her belly was really sore, and she did have a ruptured spleen, which we managed conservatively, but she had a ruptured spleen. And she's sitting there in the ER. And I remember her so vividly. I remember her so vividly. And you'll understand why I remembered her, not just those injuries. But let me take you down this path. Let me take you down this path. Let's say you're a man or a woman, and just for... Without being sexist, it usually happens uh, uh, female to male, or I see it both ways. But let's say a young woman falls in love with a guy. She meets this guy, and he's just so attractive. He's just so wonderful. He's very wealthy, and he's just got the gift of the gab. They chat for hours. They just have this wonderful, wonderful meeting. And they go out on a few dates, and more and more she aligns with him. His thinking is exactly hers, his politics, his love of travel. He, he spends money lavishly on her. He's physically attractive. Um, uh, sexually, they start engaging in a sexual relationship, just wonderful. And eventually he invites her to move into his house, and she moves into his house. And you know what? He's so wealthy, and they're traveling that she says to her mundane job, I don't need you anymore. She fires a job. Uh, he's always hanging out with her, so she doesn't see her friends anymore. Um, her mom and her father have concerns about him, so she stops talking to her mother and her family, and slowly over time, she relinquishes and cuts away all parts of her life, because this guy is just Mr. Wonderful, and she's having the best time in the world, he's supporting her, he's got this beautiful house, um, physically, emotionally, conversationally, he's everything, everything, and her world is just his world, and she slices all the rest of her world away. And one day, she's all happy, she makes dinner for him, and he comes home, and the dinner's a little bit cold, and it's something he doesn't like. And he gives her a black eye. Dinner was cold. But I love you, I am so sorry I hit you, I still love you, you're just the, the wonderful person, and I love you, and you're providing for me, and you know, it was kind of my fault that the dinner was cold, I deserved that black eye. 
Long story short, every couple of days, he's coming home and beating the crap out of her. And then one day she's trying to call her mother and he takes her cell phone away and he starts to control her world. But he's still providing her with everything. He buys her jewels. He's great physically. They go on trips. He's providing everything wonderful for her. But he's beating the crap out of her. And one day, after a particularly vicious beating, she's sitting in the ER with scrapes all over her head, with a black eye, with a ruptured spleen. And she's sitting there and saying, wow, he could have killed me. He nearly killed me. And a social worker comes to see her and says, young lady, you nearly died. You have an option. We can get a restraining order if you choose to, and we can move you out of that house. Or you can go home with him tonight. And that's such a tough choice for that woman. It seems obvious to you and I listening to that story. Of course, she's going to get the restraining order and move out. The problem with that, she has nothing. She sliced away every aspect of her life. She has nothing. All she's got is her relationship with him. And you've got to understand that. She has no friends, no job, no money, no cell phone, no family, nowhere to live. So if she gets that restraining order and moves out, she's either on the street or she's in a shelter with nothing. Victim of nothing. And if she decides to do that, her life is going to suck. For six months, for a year, for two years. But slowly, she'll re-engage with her friends. She maybe call her mother and talk to her family again. Reconnect with them. Maybe she'll get a job. Maybe she'll have some income. Maybe she'll be able to buy her a little place to, to live one day. Maybe she'll have a little bank account to support her. Maybe she'll meet somebody better. She'll have a group of friends that are there to support her and give her emotional buoyancy. She'll meet somebody that becomes a lover and becomes part of her life again. But on that night, getting that restraining order, she's got nothing the next day and she can slowly build up that world. Or she can choose to go home with him and say, look, I know that tonight was a particularly bad beating. I know that he's been beating me for a long time, but I don't care. I love him so much. My world is so tangled with him. I've got nothing. I'm afraid. I don't want to move out. I'm going to die anyway. I'm going back home with him. But do not, do not, do not go back home with him and expect not to get beaten. Do not get a restraining order and think that the restraining order is going to protect you from him. Because that's a false expectation. You go back to him, he's going to provide everything, but he's going to beat the snot out of you. And he will eventually kill you. And we will read about you in the newspaper one day. And ladies and gentlemen, that is your relationship with sugar and starch. If you're fat, if you're hypertensive, if you're diabetic, if you have metabolic syndrome, that guy I was talking about is sugar and starch. And the fatter you get and the sicker you get, the more you slice normal things out of your life. When I was fat, I couldn't cross my legs. Simple, stupid little thing that everybody should be able to do. It's just simply cross their legs. Couldn't do it when I was fat. Couldn't get into regular clothes. But we insidiously slice those things away and we absorb every punch, every punch from those carbohydrates. I had a heart attack. Well, it's because my cholesterol was high. I had a stroke because my blood clotted. I now have to inject needles of of insulin into my belly. We mitigate against our relationship with carbohydrates. We slice bits of our lives away. We live in this small little prison. And then you come to see me for help. And I tell you, we have to destroy your relationship with carbohydrates. And we may or may not use the restraining order of surgery. We don't have to. But you got to move out of that house with those carbohydrates because as long as you have that relationship with sugar and starch, you will always be a victim because you cannot control what they do to you or what you do to yourself. You cannot have a relationship with sugar and starch and expect to have a normal, healthy life. 
So I can tell you categorically what the outcome is going to be from each of those two pathways. But I cannot tell you that you have to move out of this house. That is your choice. That is your choice. And there's plenty of people who've just said, I don't care. If you do care, we can help you along that journey. It's going to be a tough, harsh journey. Because giving up carbohydrates is one of the most difficult things a human being can do. Trust me, I know. And you're going to have your screw-ups and you're going to have your slip-ups and they're going to punish you every time. But eventually you can develop a new healthy life. Eventually you can be carb-free, healthy of mind, body and spirit. But it requires sacrificing this perfect relationship that you have right now that in reality has put you in a very small prison. If you're watching this video and you are that person, that is the crossroads that you're on. There's a fork in the road right here, right now. Which path are you going to take? I am the Carb Addiction Doc. We can help. But we can't help you to make the decision. We can help you along the path you choose to walk. I'll see you next time. Maybe. Or I'll read about you in the newspaper. <laughs>